Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone to uh, the next module. This is module 10 and the first uh, three lectures are going to cover issues related to microbial growth. So we have a three part uh, topic over here and today's topic is lecture 49 and the first part of microbial growth. The topics that we are going to cover in this particular lecture is we are going to look at the general or generic bacterial growth curve. We will uh, derive monod kinetics, we will go through the de entire derivation and how it can be done both uh, mathematically as well as experimentally and the last part is the law of the minimum. So we are going to start with bacterial reproduction and we already know we have gone through it that bacteria reproduce by binary fission. Now in binary fission we have a single bacterial cell. So that's what you see at the top over here in this graphic and the cell has a double stranded circular DNA molecule. So this DNA, the first step in the replication process or in the reproduction process is replication of the DNA. So this is what you see. There is an increase in the length of the cell and the DNA is replicated. So we now have two circular strands. This Eventually, when the cell elongates enough, a septum will be formed and you can see at the center, a septum has formed here and eventually the septum will lead to separation of the cell into two parts with each part having its own double-stranded circular DNA. So that is at the uh, cellular level. Now if we want to uh, quantify the growth of bacteria in the lab or even in the environment. How do we do it? Let's go through some of the basics about it. The first thing is generation time. So what is the time required for a single cell to become two cells? And these two cells will then become four and because each one will create two. So one will go to two, two will go to four, four will go to eight, eight will go to 16 and so on. So from the time that you have a single cell to the time that you have two cells, that is the generation time. That is the time required for the population to become double the original population. Now generation times for bacteria can be around 1 to 3 hours or if you take a wider range, it can go from less than 10 minutes to several days depending on the species and depending on the growth conditions. The same species under different growth conditions will have a different growth rate and we will come to that later. So what are the factors that affect the reproduction of bacterial species? Uh, the first thing is the species itself. Not all species, not all organisms will grow at the same rate. So different species, different organisms have different growth rates. So it's species specific growth rates. That's the first thing. Second thing is the nature of the nutrient media. If you provide it rich uh, media, rich meaning high in nutrient concentration, then obviously they're going to reproduce faster. If the nutrient concentration is low, they will reproduce at a smaller or slower rate. I will show you some uh, schematics about that. And the second thing, the third thing is incubation conditions. So what are the environmental conditions? What is the pH? What is the temperature? What is the pressure? All these conditions will determine the growth rate of the organism or the species that you are uh, cultivating. 
If we want to put it in mathematical form, you can say population P, we use different terms in different textbooks, you'll find different terms. Sometimes the population of the bacterial species is shown as capital N, sometimes by capital P, and sometimes if you're measuring it in terms of biomass, it's shown as X. So all of, the, all of these uh, symbols are acceptable. So we have population P is equal to 2 to the power n where n is the number of generations so this schematic shows you one generation now if two becomes four that would be two generations so like i said if we start with a single bacterial cell we get one two four eight sixteen thirty two sixty four and so on so uh, what i just said is the nature of reproduction in bacterial cells now when we do experiments in the lab what we generally do is we take a batch culture, we add an inoculum to it and then we monitor the growth of the bacteria. So this is what I would call a generic bacterial growth curve. Now how do we measure growth? The first thing is what is growth? Growth is defined as an increase in the number of cells and then we need to quantify growth rate. So growth rate is the change in number of cells over a period of time and this is very important for whatever we are going to go through in the next few slides. Now when you are doing this in a batch culture and you try to uh, let's say draw a curve with the bacterial concentration in one case and in the second case if you are able to monitor the substrate concentration as well then you will get two curves. So the dark black line in this schematic is your biomass concentration and the dashed line is the substrate concentration. I have been talking about glucose as the starting point. So you can imagine that your substrate is glucose. It can be any other organic compound. Let me also add another word over here and that is the substrate is the limiting nutrient. So you have to generally define or rather design your experiments on the basis of limiting nutrient. And I will come to the idea of limiting nutrient uh, when we talk about the law of the minimum. So we'll keep that for the end of this lecture. But for now, just imagine that the substrate is the limiting, growth limiting nutrient. Okay. So in general, there is only one nutrient that is limiting the growth of the bacteria. And that is what we are going to, excuse me, and that is what we are going to be monitoring in these experiments. So you have these two curves. One is the biomass and the second is the substrate. You can measure concentration in two ways. You can measure it in terms of concentration of volatile suspended solids or you can measure it in terms of numbers of cells. And the number of cells can be, if you're measuring it by microscopy, then it is total number of cells. If you're using plate counts, which we generally do, then you're measuring the number of living or reproducing cells. So I will come to some of these details later on. And that is your uh, concentration on the y-axis and on the x-axis you have your time. Now biomass as you can see is increasing in this kind of um, curve where there is initially, so initially you will find that there is very little increase in cell concentration. Now if there is very little increase in cell concentration then what is the reason for that? So Remember you have started the culture, this is the beginning of the culture. So the bacteria have to be acclimated, the time required by the cells to acclimate themselves to the new environmental conditions. You have taken them from one media and put them in a fresh medium. So this old culture, if the inoculum is an old culture in stationary phase, it means they are already kind of uh, not growing in their exponential, we'll come to the, all these points as we go along. It will show a lag period when it is introduced into a new media of the same composition as the previous one. If the inoculum is in exponential phase, which means the second phase, this is the log phase, lag phase, log phase. Log phase is also called exponential phase. So, if it is 
in exponential phase from the old media and you add it to the new media, same composition, same conditions, there will be no lag phase. So the lag phase will be almost invisible. If the inocular has damaged cells, so for example, if I am doing disinfection experiments, then the inoculum is somewhat damaged. It contains a large number of damaged cells and very few survivors. Now, it's those survivors that are going to reproduce. The damaged cells cannot reproduce. So, under those conditions, you're going to see a lag phase. You can also have a lag phase when you are transferring the inoculum from an old media which may be a richer media and giving it to a new media which may not be as rich as the old media. So again the lag phase will be visible and quite uh, clear. So this is the lag phase followed by the log phase. Now another hallmark of the lag phase is that the growth rate and death rate are more or less equal. That's why they are, that's why you see a more or less horizontal line. So that defines the lag phase. There comes a point at which the number of cells that are there in the media have become acclimated to the new conditions and then they start multiplying rapidly and there is no limit except the nutrient availability. So that defines our log phase. Now they are limited only by the growth limiting nutrient. So at that point, the growth rate is much greater than the death rate. The temperature, uh, basically when we talk about incubation or environmental conditions, first thing is temperature. If you take, change the temperature, the degree of uh, or rather the rate of replication will increase. If you change the composition of the media, again there will be a change and the genetic traits of the organism. So different species will uh, grow at different rates. But in the log phase or the exponential phase, the slope or the growth rate is really dependent only on the growth limiting substrate concentration. Okay, So that is the hallmark of the exponential or log phase. Then we come to stationary phase. In the stationary phase, you will find that again the growth rate is more or less equal to the death rate and you get a horizontal line. Now in actual experiments, you may or may not see this. In my experiments with poor media, I didn't really see a stationary uh, part of the curve. It went up and then started going down almost in immediately. So it depends. The nature of the stationary phase can be very short or it can be quite long. What does it depend on? It depends on the concentration of toxic byproducts in the media. So let's say a large number of acids are created. For example, in aerobic uh, media, you will find in any media, in fact, aerobic or anaerobic, a large amount of acids are created in the first phase of metabolism. So the pH of the media will go down unless there is sufficient buffer added to the media. Now, if there is insufficient buffer, then you will find that the pH has gone down and uh, you will also find that the essential nutrients are being exhausted because the biomass has increased to such a point that there is insufficient nutrient availability. So these are the two major conditions that will determine the nature of the stationary phase. How long is it or is it, in, uh, is it visible in your experiments and so on. So those are some of the things that you can uh, look for. And finally, we come to the death phase. The death phase is when the death rate is much greater than the growth rate. So at this point, when the death rate is higher than the growth rate, the cell concentration starts coming down and it can come down very fast at an exponential rate or it can come down very slowly. So again, it depends on the environmental conditions or the incubation conditions as well as the nutrient availability and the concentration of toxic byproducts. So all these factors will determine the nature of the curve, but this is what a generic bacterial growth curve looks like in a batch culture. Look at the substrate concentration. The substrate concentration is the reverse of the biomass concentration. In the lag phase, there is no change, which means there is no a significant utilization of the substrate in the lag phase. As the exponential phase takes off, the substrate consumption 
is very fast as well because the biomass is utilizing the substrate and you get exponential decay in the substrate concentration in the media. Stationary phase again it's more or less horizontal and in the death phase you will find that most of the substrate has been consumed in and um, become part of the biomass and you have very little substrate left towards the end. Now in some cases this may never happen, this may never be zero, it may stop at some other point anywhere in between the zero uh, time is equal to zero concentration levels. So S at T is equal to zero is the highest concentration and you may have, you may never get to zero. It all depends on the nature of the conditions, experimental conditions. Now what we want to look at next is the exponential part of the growth curve. So let's just look at our generations, time and number of cells. Now you can express the number of cells like I said either in terms of cells per ml or in terms of milligrams per liter in ter uh, and we measure it as volatile suspended solids. So it depends on what you're trying to do, what you're trying to achieve. So you can do it any way you want that there are several methods for doing that. Now our first generation and assuming our starting point is a single cell. So the first uh, cell is one, it goes to two, four and so on. So this is what you see over here over a period of time and assuming that the doubling time for this particular hypothetical case is 10 minutes. Okay, so here you have the time, the increments of time, you have the number of generations and the number of cells. So the number of cells is growing exponentially and that is shown by the orange curve and uh, the blue line tells you the generation number. So the, that's the number of generations and the orange line tells you the number of cells. Now we don't usually start any experiment with, the, uh, with a single bacterial cell. It's not possible to inoculate any media with a single cell. We generally start with a uh, inoculum of maybe thousand cells, million cells and so on. Now here we have another hypothetical example where you have time in hours. The initial concentration is 100 cells per ml. You can convert it to log n by n0. n0 is the number of cells at t is equal to 0. So when n is equal to n0, that's our starting point at t is equal to 0. So these are the graphs that you're going to get. The orange line is the log concentration. So log n by n0. So this is what we also call normalized cell concentration. So you can write it as natural log, you can write it as log, uh, log base 10, either way you know how to convert from one to the other. And you have log n by n0 is a straight line. So um, on the x-axis we have time which is not mentioned here but this is time on the x-axis and you can see that the number of cells is very difficult to show uh, on a linear scale because they are growing exponentially so you need a log scale to be able to show the number of cells and uh, the relative growth uh, relative to the initial concentration. So we call it normalized cell concentration so this is log uh, natural log or you can write log base 10 either way. This is what we call the exponential growth phase. It's by binary fission. You get a straight line on a log n by n0 plot or on a natural log n by uh, n0 plot. So this is a log linear plot which will give you a straight line and on a linear linear plot it's very difficult to look at it because your growth your numbers are very very high. Um, so here we come to what happens in a single batch culture. Now um, in a single batch culture what you will be doing is you will be measuring the number of cells or the weight of the biomass produced. Now if you're measuring weight of the biomass you will generally filter the media, take a small amount of the media, filter it, measure the volatile suspended solids. So that is VSS 
and we normally express it in terms of milligrams per liter. Number of cells, if you're doing plate counts or microscopy, you will do it in terms of number of cells per ml. So there are different ways of doing it. So N normally stands for number of cells per ml. X normally stands for the weight of biomass produced in terms of VSS. You also want to measure growth rates and we will come to the derivation of monod kinetics. So for deriving the equation for monod kinetics, a single batch culture is not sufficient. For that, what you need is the same growth limiting substrate, but different concentrations of the substrate. So you will do a series of substrate exper uh, experiments with different substrate concentrations. The same initial inoculum size, the same incubation period and incubation conditions and the same volume of media have to be maintained so that everything else is the same except the substrate conditions. So now here is how we uh, come to measuring the parameters required for uh, quantifying growth and for understanding monod kinetics for any growth limiting substrate. So as I said, you run a series of experiments with different substrate concentrations and the substrate is your growth limiting nutrient. So here you see five different substrate concentrations S1 to S5. Um, S5 is the lowest concentration and S1 is the highest concentration. On the y-axis, you have the cell concentration and on the x-axis, you have time in hours. Now, when you run each of these batch cultures, you're likely to see the curves that are shown in this graph. At some point, you will find that they reach stationary phase. Now, we're not really interested in the stationary phase. The stationary phase and the concentration at the stationary phase level is a function of the substrate concentration. So we will come to that point in a little bit. What is important in the exponential phase is the slope of each one of these curves. So we are going to call the slope of each curve mu1, mu2, mu3, mu4 and mu5. Now that is what I have here. R or mu is the specific growth rate and that is particular for a specific substrate concentration. So S1 corresponds to mu1, S2 corresponds to mu2 and so on. N or X is the cell number of biomass. And when we write the generic form, the rate growth rate, Rg stands for growth rate. You can express, as, express this as dn by dt or dx by dt. If you're using the number of cells then dn by dt is equal to mu n and when you integrate it you get n is equal to n0 e to the power mu t. Now as I said this mu itself is a function of the substrate concentration so we want to come to this equation. Now let's see how we get there. We now have a series of mu values and we can plot them against s. So we have five s values and corresponding mu values. So when I plot mu versus s, I will get a curve like this. I should get a curve like this, okay? Now, there is a point at which you get maximum growth rate. Regardless of what your s value is, you can continue increasing s beyond this point, the mu value will not change. So that is my mu max. So this is mu max. Then we define another parameter called Ks. Ks is defined as the half velocity constant, which is the substrate concentration at which the specific growth rate is exactly half of mu max. So when mu max is half, so here we have mu max is equal to 0 0.3, half of that is 0 0.15, what is the corresponding substrate concentration and that is what you see over here and that value is Ks, K subscript S. Okay, so having gone through uh, these two uh, sets of uh, data acquisition you might say, then we come to how we derive this equation. So now that I know that mu is a function of S, I can write it in this form which is called the pseudo first order reaction rate. 
Now, when S is much greater than KS, so we have KS over here and let's say S is much, much greater than KS. So, in this region, we see that mu is equal to mu max. So, it's a zero order reaction over there. Then we have another case where S is much less than KS. So, let's say we are in this part of the curve. At this point, it's a first order reaction because if S, you can do the math yourself and if S is uh, much, much less than Ks, then it drops out of this equation. It can be thrown out literally and you get mu m S divided by Ks. So, this is negligible compared to Ks and you get mu is equal to mu S. So, this is your first order and otherwise in the intermediate two situations, this is our equation which holds for all of them. Now, we need another parameter to relate substrate to biomass. So, what is the relationship between substrate and biomass? That is given by what we call yield. So, biomass yield describes the relationship between biomass and substrate. So, we have minus dx by ds is the relationship between the biomass that tells us the biomass yield and it also gives us a relationship between biomass and substrate concentration. All right, so what are the assumptions in monod kinetics? Now, we know that our substrate is a single growth limiting nutrient. For any given S, dS by dt is equal to Kxs divided by Ks plus S. Now, what are these two new parameters? Small k is the maximum substrate utilization rate per unit mass of cells. So, instead of monitoring number of cells, up to this point I have been talking in terms of monitoring the biomass or the number of cells. Now, instead if you have no ability to mo monitor the biomass and instead you are monitoring the substrate, which happens very often in the kinds of experiments we do, then you have a small k value. So, this is your maximum substrate utilization rate per unit mass of cells. I have already mentioned what capital K S is, that is the half velocity constant, the substrate concentration at mu max by and biomass yield has also been defined. Now, given what we derived in the previous slide, we can now substitute these values. So, y can be expressed as mu m by small k that will give you the conversion factor for going from x to s and mu m remains the same as I said it and then mu m will be substituted here by y k and you get y k s divided by k s plus s. Now, why this form? Because this is easier to measure. So, y can be measured easily. You know how much substrate has been consumed, the initial and the final concentration is given and you know how much biomass is produced. So, y is one of the easiest parameters to measure and small k like I said is also not difficult to measure. It depends on the nature of the substrate. Then we come to the last part of this derivation. I have already shown you the generic bacterial growth curve and we know there is a death phase or a, uh, another word that is used is the endogenous de decay phase. Um, in uh, cell biology, I spoke about the fact that you have feast and famine type condition. So, when the nutrients are exhausted, the cells are in a famine like situation. The nutrient availability is very low compared to what they require. So, they enter into this death phase or what is often called the endogenous decay phase. They will utilize whatever uh, storage granules they have, they will consume their own biomass and that is why it is called endogenous decay rate and there is no further growth because they cannot reproduce, the nutrients are not there, there is no, um, there is insufficient uh, nutrition for the uh, cells to reproduce and continue to increase. So, this is the final stage in the growth curve and mu at this point is modified to inclu include the endogenous decay rate. So, this is minus kd. In some textbooks, the letter b is used and we will be seeing that in a subsequent lecture. So, we, either way it remains the same, it means the same. So, this is the same equation with the final stage, the endogenous decay rate is included.
Let us now come to the last part of this topic and that is the law of the minimum. I have been talking about the fact that there is a growth limiting substrate or a growth limiting nutrient. Now we have seen that all bacteria as well as other organisms require not just one nutrient but many many different nutrients, maybe hundreds. Okay, How do we know which one is the growth limiting nutrient? So this is the law of the minimum that helps us to define the growth limiting nutrient. This is a fundamental principle that applies to the growth of all living organisms. It was first formulated in agricultural science way back in 1828 and it was popularized by Liebig. So uh, many textbooks, the older textbooks use it and they often call it the Liebig's uh, law of the minimum. But this is some new uh, information that has come to light. What is this law? Any element that is least available relative to the requirements of an organism is defined as the limiting nutrient and the growth of that organism is going to be directly proportionate to the concentration of the limiting nutrient. Any of the nutrients that we have seen in previous lectures can be a growth limiting nutrient but for simplicity because it's very difficult to do complex things everything that we do in the lab and the assumptions we make for environmental conditions are often very simplistic and we assume that the macronutrients are one of the macronutrients are the growth limiting nutrients. So we can say it's a carbon limiting growth media, we can say it's a nitrogen or a phosphate or a sulfur limited uh, growth media. We generally say these things about our experimental conditions. However, it's important to remember that any of the elements, they may be macronutrients or micronutrients, any of them can be the growth limiting nutrient for an, any organism. Um, it's also important to remember that when we talk about nutritional deficiencies, even within human beings, it's the same law that we are keeping in mind because it is the particular nutrient that is deficient in either the diet or the environment of that person and or any other organism and that is what is causing uh, some impact on the growth of that uh, organism. It may be a human being or any other organism. Then we come to uh, eutrophication and uh, nutrient concentrations. Now what happens in eutrophication is that you get algal production as a function of carbon dioxide, nitrogen, phosphorus and I have kept it as simple as carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus. Now these are three essential macronutrients that are required for the growth of something like an algae. You can do this for bacteria, you can do this for any other organism, the same principle applies. What does this empirical formula for the algal cell tell us? Nitrogen this is the molar ratio. So this is the stoichiometric empirical formula for an algal cell. For a bacterial cell, we use C5H7O2N and that is available in all the textbooks. So you can use the same principles to understand uh, the same idea and apply it to a bacterial cell. I'm taking a more complex example here of the algal cell. So we've taken three essential nutrients carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus assuming that hydrogen and oxygen can never be limiting because these organisms are growing in water and water is plenty so they will never be limiting hydrogen and oxygen. So we focus on carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus so ignoring carbon for the first part we have nitrogen to phosphorus ratio on a molar basis is 16. And when you multiply it by the molecular weights, it becomes 7.2. Now, this is, then we come to the second part. Let's put all three of them together, C and P. So what is the ratio of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus? That is 106 to 16 to 1. Now, notice that the last element, the least required element is normalized. Uh, so it's 1. So everything else is normalized with respect to phosphorus. So you can convert it either, uh, you can utilize either moles or milligrams or grams, whatever it is um, acceptable. And this brings us to what is called the red field 
ratio. The red field ratio is about the nitrogen to phosphorus, but it also includes several other nutrients. If you go back to the original paper, you will find that it includes sulfur and silica and so many other elements. But people have generally focused on nitrogen and phosphorus. So what was interesting about this particular paper, which was published as far back as 1934 is, that the phytoplankton in all oceans, no matter which part of the world you're in, the ratio of nitrogen and phosphorus in the phytoplankton, which means algae for the most part, is fixed at 16 is to 1 molar ratio. And you can see the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Indian Ocean, you can see the data, it fits along this line of 16 is to 1. So this is nitrate on the x-axis and phosphate on the y-axis and you can see that the uptake and release is in more or less in equilibrium and that's why it's called the red field ratio for the person who uh, came up with this idea and it was published and so on. So this is a well-known concept that the rate of nutrient uptake and release and these are the growth limiting nutrients for the algae or phytoplankton in the oceans and so on and it's completely uniform all across the glo globe. Um, so with a carbon to nitrogen ratio less than 5, C would be limiting. At C by N ratios greater than 6, N would be limiting. For N is to P ratio less than 7, N would be limiting and the other way around phosphate would be limiting. This brings me to the end of this topic. I will stop at this point. Thank you.